really need more awareness about bipolar disorder, and uh, we need to step up our efforts in uh, uh, you know trying to understand the mechanisms and uh, develop better ways to uh, identify it early and uh, treat patients that suffer from this severe mental illness. And uh, I just want to show you a picture of my professional home in Houston. And uh, the, the, the top picture is what is called the UT Harris County Psychiatric Center. It's a 250-bed acute psych hospital. It's a state facility uh, in close proximity to the medical school. I, I actually uh, spend my mornings at the hospital and my afternoons at the bottom building, which is where the bulk of the administrative components, some of our specialty clinics and research labs in psychiatry are, are located. But Houston has been a really uh, wonderful home for us and really a nice community, great people. Uh, you will recognize this as one of Van Gogh's uh, paintings. This particular one is called The Corridor in the Asylum, and he painted that the year before his death. And again, it, it's here to illustrate how intriguing this illness is. Some of the brightest, uh, most accomplished people that ever lived uh, suffered from it, and despite, or perhaps a little bit because of it, have really gone uh, where you know, no other uh, man or, or a woman has, has gone before. Uh, the, the disease presents in many uh, shapes and forms, and uh, is this, uh, alternance of uh, you know times when folks have lots of energy uh, that you know comes out of the blue and they may uh, be, th their judgment may be a little clouded and folks may be uh, you know more reckless on things that they normally would not do that they may do during this uh, period called mania or a, a milder form of mania is what we call hypomania. So that, that's the, the presentation of the illness that gets the most attention because you know, that's generally when pe people may land in, into a hospital or they may uh, uh, burn bridges with uh, family and friends and employers. However, the silent killer is really the depression phase. And uh, so, you know, some of my bipolar patients, they aren't concerned about the mania because they, you know, the way they describe it, all that energy and you're more confident. So for many patients, that's actually a, uh, you know, a side of the illness that they may like. Uh, however, the depression can really last uh, a long time and months and can be very impairing and uh, suicide is you know, a, the dreaded uh, outcome there. In other instances, they come together, and, and that's actually very dangerous. If you have the energy of the manic phase, but the mindset of depression, where if you are that depression, that depressed that you don't want to uh, leave the bed, you know, perhaps you're not going to do anything to try to harm yourself. However, if you are, you know, the mindset of depression where you think nothing will ever get better, you are so desperate, but yet you're very energetic and sort of like. Uh, 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 anxious and, and uh, uh, you know, running around. I mean, that's a particular uh, vulnerable uh, uh, phase of the illness, uh, you know, when suicide is, is a big risk. Um, we've come a long way uh, to, I mean, we know with confidence now that this is a disease of the brain. Uh, we are not talking about, uh, you know, major and drastic changes in one's brain, like some of the neurological disorders uh, uh, come with. Uh, but, but definitely using more refined tools, certainly the very many aspects of the brain functioning are abnormal, in, in, in primarily during the acute phases of the illness, but even changes in uh, aspects of the brain anatomy. And I like to show this diagram here. This is from a colleague named Yvette Chalene, who is now at Penn, and pretty much it illustrates nicely that, so, so there is a genetic vulnerability that is not truly understood. Uh, you know, we don't have much clarity as to what the genes that call for vulnerability are. Uh, we do know uh, it, is, uh, it has a strong genetic component because it does run in families more so than many other psychiatric conditions. And uh, stress has a lot to do with it. Uh, de definitely, I mean, primarily early in the course of this illness, the episodes seem to be triggered by, triggered by stressors. Later, I mean, as it goes on, for many of these patients, 
the, the new episodes start coming without much relationship with what's going, in, going on in their lives. Like, life may be great and you may uh, w wake up one morning falling into depression and sink into deep depression. Or, uh, or the reverse, you know, out of the blue you, you develop a, a manic episode. And that results in changes in the brain, and, uh, the, you know, the, the, the volume, like for size, uh, changes in, in some of the key parts of the brain involved in modulating our emotions and our drives, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Well, it's also a systemic illness in a way. There is a, more and more research showing that patients with bipolar disorder, they have a, a shortened lifespan by as many as 10, 15 years, and they have a higher prevalence, a higher risk of medical problems like a stroke or a cardiovascular problems. So it takes a toll on the brain, but it also takes a toll on, on their body. Uh, well, this is how I started out as a uh, young uh, resident at uh, University of Pittsburgh and uh, some really you know, wonderful people around, great mentors. And uh, John Mann uh, was my, my, one of my first mentors there. And uh, so he encouraged me to write. So let, let, write a review. Let's compile what is known uh, as far as the anatomy of uh, mood disorders and contrasting bipolars and unipolars. And, uh, this uh, sparked my interest, and uh, I've made a, a, an entire uh, career uh, uh, out of it. And this ended up being a, a highly uh, cited uh, uh, manuscript. I mean, this was a, a, it's a review paper, but it was very comprehensive in a time when, you know, not much was being uh, said about uh, th these disorders having clearly a, a neuroanatomical uh, underpinning. Well, so. Um, in that review, we, we probably, so, so the first thing we found was that if you look for global changes in the brain, like generalized changes in the brain, the evidence was a little questionable. But then uh, more clearly for certain regional changes in, in, in our areas of the brain, like uh, what are the, you know, what's called the amygdala, which is involved in modulating our emotions, and hippocampus is another uh, structure. So um, uh, we felt that that had probably something to do with how refined the tools were. So if you give uh, MRIs, you take MRIs of the brains of patients with bipolars and you, bipolar disorder, and you match those with uh, folks who are mentally healthy, uh, usually, uh, you know, once they've been ill for many years, they've had many episodes, those are the patients where a neuroradiologist will be able to read by naked eye that, uh, well, there is some evidence here that, you know, whichever process is happening is sort of like global, some evidence of perhaps some atrophy there. Uh, we measure that by enlarged ventricles or also widened uh, brain, brain soul side. And I, I have a picture to illustrate that. So what we've done here from my work in San Antonio, we had a, a, a semi-automated technique where rather than relying on the naked eye, we could actually measure the specific width of some of the main, you know, we, we picked, uh, uh, so, so those are like the, the different soci of the brain. This is this, a convoluted this structure there as you, you're seeing. And well, essentially whatever we measured, no matter, you know, frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, uh, the, the patients had a wider soci compared to healthies. And those are mostly young adults. The mean age here was like 37 years old. And essentially showing that, that if, if you look a more, ref, if you use a more refined tool, you will find some evidence of a generalized uh, pathological process taking place. And by the way, well, Dr. Carter will tell us that, but in schizophrenic patients, that's even, I mean, more drastic. I mean, that is a disease where if, if, you, if, if we had, in this particular study with the same technique, a group of patients with schizophrenia of the same age, we would find a lot more pronounced uh, uh, brain, uh, like generalized brain abnormalities. Well, then there is a colleague uh, from uh, University of Cincinnati, very productive group uh, led by Dr. Steve Strakowski. And uh, they did an interesting study published some years back where they had, uh, well, they took MRIs of the brains of patients with bipolar disorder, and then they measured the size of the brain ventricles, which again, that's sort of like a measure of generalized uh, uh, pathology there. If, if there is a lot of atrophy, usually the, the brain uh, ventricles enlarge. There are other things that can cause that too, but 
but, but you know, if, if you exclude all their neurological pathologies, I mean, that, that's a good measure of uh, uh, some global uh, pathology there. Well, anyway, um, they scan healthy, patient, healthy individuals, and then patients as they had their first episode of mania. And you guys know to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder. In many instances, you had episodes of depression before, but it is not till we see the first manic episode or what we call mixed episode, when the mania and the depression come together. It's not till you see that that you can really establish, the, uh, you know, the, you, you, in a way, you, you upgrade the diagnosis from recurrent depression into bipolar disorder once you see that. And that's what these folks had. So it's not to say that they had just started having mood symptoms. They might have had depression before, but this is the time when they first became manic and, and then were uh, called, uh, you know, as having bipolar disorder. Well, and then also they, they found a group of individuals who had been ill for longer periods of time, who had had multiple manic episodes. What they found, which is really interesting, early in the course, and by the way, those were mostly young adults in the early, early I guess in their 20s, in you know, the late 20s. So the patients on the first episode of mania did not differ from the healthy controls for the size of the lateral ventricles of the brain. Essentially showing that, I mean, well, if you're talking about global pathology, at least by this measure, it's not there. But when they looked at the ones with multiple episodes, it, it, it's a big spread, as you can see here. And they were, uh, the size of the ventricles were statistically larger compared to the first episode manics and the healthy controls. And again, this is just cross-sectional data, but suggests that perhaps as they course through this disease, as they have more episodes, you know, the pathology in the brain seems to gradually uh, progress. Uh, we also published a study some years back with our San Antonio data. Uh, and, and, and we measured, this is like a measure of the, the total uh, size of the brain, and we split that in gray matter and white matter. And we also had, so we had bipolar patients and we had unipolar patients. Like when you say unipolar, they only have the depression phase and, and kind of like recurrent uh, uh, depression, recurrent clinical depression. And uh, so what I want to show you here, the bold line is for the bipolar patients and it's a more clear inverse relationship, statistically significant with length of illness. Longer they had been ill, the smaller the total size of the brain was. Then for the unipolar patients here, the dotted line, you know, it's less inclined. Uh, on this side for, uh, you know, the volumes of white matter in the brain, the relationship is less clear. And again, not, not a longitudinal study. This is evidence for, for, uh, from a cross-sectional study. Also suggesting that perhaps the longer they've been ill, you know, the more brain pathology uh, you will see. Uh, again, back to the work of Dr. Shalin, and this is just a nice diagram that will illustrate these phrenolimbic circuits in the brain and uh, very interconnected areas uh, involving a part of the brain like the, what's called the orbital frontal cortex, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and uh, you know, these fibers interconnect through what's called the thalamus into the middle temporal lobe, amygdala, hippocampus. So a lot of this research has really focused on trying to identify changes in these areas, in the, the, the fiber pathways that interconnect them, and there are new, newer uh, imaging techniques to do that, uh, as well as probing the functional, you know, and, and, and Dr. Cara and many of uh, his colleagues here are actually experts in developing uh, the right paradigms for functional imaging to probe how cognition interfaces with uh, emotion, and so that's become a, a very active uh, uh, you know, area of research in, in recent years. Um, I, like, I wanna show you this meta-analysis done by some colleagues in the UK. The lead person is a colleague named Matthew Kempton. Well, it's just a good summary of uh, the status of this literature where folks, well, our group included, but, but also many others looked for uh, anatomical changes with MRI uh, studies in, in patients with bipolar disorder and patients with depression. So uh, the, the short message here is that, the, and if you look here, you know, th th those are the significance values, and this is a comparison uh, 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 unipolar patients, depressed patients versus healthy controls. 
a meta-analysis of the available literature. So it seems like, I mean, it's sort of like the summary that called it putamen globus pallidus seem to be shrunk. And uh, hippocampus is another area that seems to be shrunk. Uh, then uh, for the bipolars, the areas, I mean, th those areas, at least in the meta-analysis, don't distinguish, uh, you know, doesn't hold up as much, but a, a shrinkage in the size of the corpus callosum and also uh, a significant increase in what are called this like white matter hyperintensities, some small bright lesions that can be detected in the MRI. They're very non-specific, many uh, like hypertension, diabetes, many uh, medical problems that will affect the blood vessels in the brain, the, the, the delivery of blood to the brain will result in, in higher levels of those. They're present in schizophrenia, for example, OCD, all the psychiatric disorders, neuropsychiatric disorders. So they are by no means diagnostic, but they are indeed present at higher uh, 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 rates in patients with bipolar disorder. Uh, the, their role might be uh, by disrupting some of the fiber pathways that interconnect these phrenolimbic uh, circuits. So, so again, in, in, on the bipolar side, not as much the basal ganglia pathology, some questionable finds for the middle temporal lobe uh, structures in some studies, but, but not holding up in the large meta-analysis here. But, but uh, a shrinkage in the hippocampus, uh, the hippocampus, the corpus callosum uh, holds up more consistently, as well as the increased rates of uh, uh, white matter hyperintensities you know, particular, particularly sort of like periventricular and deeper in the brain. Uh, the, there is some literature from uh, post-mortem studies. The difficulty here is that the death process will bring many changes in the brain, so there's always the, the difficult issue of trying to disentangle the pathology that has to do with the illness from, you know, what took place uh, uh, after death. Well, despite those caveats, uh, some studies have looked at uh, you know, some of the same areas where the imaging studies show abnormalities, like the prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, and showing uh, usually like decreased uh, number and decreased size of neurons in these areas. Also some involvement of what I call the, the glial cells, you know, that sort of like uh, uh, support the, the, the neuronal cells. So, so it seems to involve glial and uh, uh, neuronal pathology and, um, you know, affecting areas like the prefrontal cortex the hippo, uh, and the hippocampus as well. So it seems to match, you know, uh, uh, by and large, uh, uh, the, the main findings from the, the imaging studies. Well, I was part uh, a few, well, it's going now on, I guess, four years already. Uh, of a uh, international effort where folks working on this field agreed to uh, combine our data sets. Uh, so some sites here were from Europe, uh, Dr. Mali is actually from Australia, and uh, some, several North American groups. So, I mean, we, we pulled our data sets together, and uh, in, in, I guess in a grandiose fashion, we call that a mega-analysis, but the size was very large. Uh, we ended up with uh, 321 patients with bipolar type 1, 442 healthy controls, you know, to see, to try to reconcile uh, a, this discrepancy in, in this literature. And, uh, I mean, we, what we found, I mean, well, for some evidence for uh, enlarged uh, uh, lateral ventricles, for some reason here, primarily on the right side from the, for this meta-analysis. But also enlargement in some uh, structures, like uh, here the putamen, the temporal lobe, which seem to be primarily driven by medication use. And I have another slide to show you that. But the, the two main take home points from this uh, international collaborative study here is that, well, first, uh, length of illness seems to be inversely related to many of these uh, anatomical measurements. I mean, suggesting essentially that, you know, the longer you've been ill, the more uh, pathology one will find in your brain. Uh, and then also that, uh, in this case, many of these patients were on lithium. So we found some really uh, clear evidence that lithium you know, seems to uh, uh, you know, tip the balance on, on the other way. I mean, uh, uh, so, so what I want to show you here, the top figure is for hippocampal size. The bottom figure is for amygdala size. And uh, you will see that the healthy patients and patients not on lithium, here and there, 
So statistically lower size of the hippocampus and the amygdala in the patients not on, not on treatment, actually. You know? And here, uh, folks on lithium actually had higher uh, volumes of uh, you know, both hippocampus and uh, uh, amygdala, suggesting that, well, you know, that seems to be a medication effect here. Uh, this has been debated. Uh, uh, I will show you uh, another study that we've done, which um, was published uh, in the Biological Psychiatry. Actually, the journal that came uh, uh, is the deputy editor. Uh, it's a great journal. Uh, uh, it's not only because they you know, made our nice figure here, the, the cover of that particular issue, which is something that I'm very proud of. But uh, so, so this is a collaboration with uh, Dr. Bearden uh, and Dr. Thompson at UCLA. And uh, applying, uh, um, this was actually some data we, we had collected in Pittsburgh. And uh, we had patients, bipolar patients, that we studied before they got into any medications. And then bipolar patients who had been on lithium for a while. Uh, th th there are some bipolar patients who respond to lithium uh, better than anything else. And they, you know, they, they le learn how to live with uh, whichever side effects. And, uh, and it helps them tremendously. One of such is if you read the book by Kay Jamison, the Hopkins professor who came public some years ago to say, to, you know, to essentially tell her story about struggles with bipolar disorder. For her, lithium was a great drug. It's not for everybody, I mean, uh, but there are patients out there where lithium is the best thing they can try. Uh, you know, obviously there are people who respond better to other treatments as well, but, but in this case here, so a group of patients who had been on lithium, usually for months, if not years, doing well on that by and large. And then we had folks who uh, had not been on treatment yet in healthy controls, and, and again, they were mostly in their mid-30s, so young adults. Well, so I want to show you here, when we did this cortical mapping across sort of like the whole brain, anything here that is not blue on the top figure, I mean, that's the contrast bipolar on lithium versus healthy controls. Anything that is not blue shows a statistically higher uh, a percentage of gray matter, so concentration of levels of gray matter in the brain. Uh, then the middle call in, in patients compared to healthy controls. So the middle column here, you see it's mostly blue. Oh, there are very few scattered areas, but it's so mostly kind of like no, not much difference in the amount of gray matter across several cortical areas in the bipolars, not on lithium versus healthy controls. And, and when we contrasted the bipolars on lithium versus the health controls, it's kind of like the, the same uh, you know, pattern that we had seen before, I mean, where uh, you know, several cortical areas right hemisphere, le left hemisphere, and uh, uh, lateral and medial surface of the brain uh, showing uh, you know, uh, uh, widespread areas of increased uh, gray matter. Well, the, why, why does lithium do that? I mean, this has been debated. Uh, well, some people suggested that if in preclinical studies, lithium seems to have some neuroprotective effects, perhaps for the folks who have been on lithium for a while, you know, that neuroprotection will translate in more gray matter in the brain, perhaps even above the levels you'd find in healthy controls, as the data here seems to uh, suggest. Uh, all the people say, well, could this be an artifact, something that lithium is doing to the MR signal? And uh, that, that, I don't think that controversy is uh, solved. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is compelling. I mean, it does, uh, uh, it's based on preclinical data showing that lithium has some uh, neuroprotective effects. But that's an, an, an area that, uh, an issue that remains open where, where more research is, is needed, I mean, to, to clearly document that. Well, so we did studies also in children and adolescents, and uh, we found very similar changes uh, in the brain. Uh, more like regional changes in uh, parts of the brain, like the anterior cingulate, uh, the, the amygdala is, an, 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 and that, that, that actually has a lot of consistency. For whatever reason, kids with bipolar disorder, uh, the, there is a shrinkage in the amygdala that seems to start at an early age. And on the adults, it's, you know, if anything, some enlargement, perhaps medication driven, like we've seen. Uh, uh, here, but, but again, you know, the data that I also showed you before suggests that if you look at the size of the amygdala, amygdala in the ones 
that have not been more consistently treated, the ones who have not been on lithium, you know, uh, perhaps you, you'd find a shrinkage there too. So, so children and adolescents, a similar pattern of brain abnormalities in these frontal limbic regions, uh, um, you know, compared, pretty similar to what we had reported on, on the adults. Well, we also use a technique called magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which allows us to do some neurochemical measurements in the brain. Uh, this was a court we recruited at, uh, in San Antonio when we were there. We were interested in this primarily in, in what's called N-acetyl-aspartate, which is a uh, sort of like a, a, a non-specific measure of neuronal health, uh, any type of uh, uh, brain uh, pathology, brain insult will lower the levels and, and if that pathology resolves, the NA levels go back up. So it's non-specific, but it's kind of like sensitive for uh, early changes. And, uh, and this is just an illustration of kind of like we, we go, uh, we acquire the MR signal from, from like a, a slab of the brain, and then we can do more like regional measurements within that uh, larger slab. And uh, so, and then, I mean, I don't have a, a, a picture here to show the actual MRS peak, but from that peak you can measure, estimate uh, uh, the levels of different chemicals uh, uh, of interest in the brain. NAA is one of them. You can measure creatine, phosphocreatine, we, you know, which is a measure of like brain and metabolism. You can also measure uh, choline, phosphocholine, which like, those are like membrane uh, components. Well, so um, what I want to show you here, after we corrected for multiple comparisons, the, what, what holds up is statistical, statistically significant. So changes in the medial prefrontal cortex, both right and left, as well as dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, primarily on uh, the white matter, more so than the gray matter. And uh, both NAA as well as creatine, phosphocreatine, uh, are lower in uh, patients uh, compared to uh, controls. And, and those were children and adolescents, essentially documenting that early on we will find some of the main change, same changes that have been reported in adults in children and uh, uh, adolescents, in, you know, in some of these same, same regions. Well, so we are, we are also intrigued by uh, our findings that, uh, well, uh, so, so we had studies showing that the corpus callosum was shrunk and that was, you know, others had corroborated that. So we paired up with a, a colleague, uh, one of my former mentors in, in Pittsburgh, Dr. Macher Keshavan, who is now a, a professor at Harvard University and just a phenomenal guy. Uh, we used uh, the MR signal as a putative measure of uh, myelination. And uh, so what we found here is that the, 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 the signal intensity, you know, the, the, the intensity of the MR signal in the corpus callosum uh, and, and it's, it's divided in five anatomical regions. You know, that it's, it's sort of like a, a, a link, uh, I guess a longer structure where you, you can uh, anatomically subdivide it. But pretty much across the whole structure, the MR uh, signal intensity was lower in patients compared to healthy controls, you know, highly significant uh, statistically. Again, this is a pilot study with a relatively small number, 16, uh, uh, children and adolescents, and 21 health, matched healthy controls. Well, but essentially suggesting uh, uh, some pathology in the corpus callosum early on. And the corpus, corpus callosum is important because that's where the fibers that interconnect both brain hemispheres, that's where they, they cross. So essentially suggesting some level of pathology that can be detected pretty early on. Okay, so in these same imaging studies, we often did uh, extensive neurocognitive testing of our patients, and we summarized the findings on the, on the pediatric side in a meta-analysis. Uh, Dr. Fraser is a uh, uh, neuropsychologist uh, who works at the Cleveland Clinic, and Eric Youngstrom is my collaborator from uh, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So uh, we essentially found broad-based uh, uh, neurocognitive changes that in many ways resemble what, uh, you know, the changes that have been reported for patients. And to summarize that for you here, so larger differences in, in this uh, uh, reveal. 
uh, essentially for uh, measures of verbal memory. Moderate differences for attention, executive function in working memory, in vi visual memory, visual perceptual skills, verbal fluency. Small differences, you know, but still uh, significant for uh, reading, motor speed, and, and also to some extent full scale uh, uh, IQ. So again, a mild effect there. And so something to keep in mind here, I mean, some of these patients uh, have uh, their cognitive uh, uh, functioning more preserved. And those tend to be the folks who can really uh, keep up pretty well and, and accomplish uh, great things in their, uh, whichever field of effort they are in, compared to folks where, uh, you know, they tend to have more episodes and they end up with uh, wider, like broader uh, cognitive uh, impairment, which I mean, you know, tends to be the base, the basis of a lot of the functional impairment that they they will have. So I guess what I'm trying to say, I mean, not not, not anybody you know who has bipolar disorder will end up, um, you know, like in, like well, Van Gogh. I mean, I just showed you the. So, so there is uh, some patients do, and uh, it's not quite known. It's very intriguing, but 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 if you think about it, if if the cognitively you're well preserved, and then you have these periods where you need little sleep and you you feel very confident, you're very creative, you know that can really uh, propel folks to uh, accomplish great things, uh, at least to some individuals. Well, so the next question is, is this disorder neurodevelopmental? And we did a review paper uh, a few years back to try to answer this question. The, the, the short summary is that, yeah, some signal not as strong as what, what is available for schizophrenia. And uh, so we did a review of the, the clinical literature and things that one normally looks at, for example, uh, perinatal uh, risk, so complicated pregnancies, problems in delivery, uh, you know, do they, are they a risk factor for future development of bipolar disorder? Uh, well, this data here from Dr. Pavluri, Manny Pavluri at the University of Illinois in Chicago seems to suggest that it is. The odds ratio here is six, so yeah, it's, it's a, apparently a sizable risk. If you look into the schizophrenia li literature, I mean, this particular factor would be even more strongly uh, 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 pointed out as a uh, uh, risk factor. Well, but the highest risk factor from uh, Dr. Pavaluri's uh, work here with pediatric bipolar uh, children is really having a first degree relative with bipolar disorder, like odds ratio of 15. Well, this is a finding that is very important clinically because, you know, for the ones of us who are clinicians or who have uh, a case of bipolar disorder uh, in, in our families, uh, so that is a big red, red flag. I mean, I, I told you we don't know what the genes are, but there is some substantial her heritability, uh, probably alongside with autism, bipolar disorder and autism, I mean, are very, you know, uh, right up there on the list of the most heritable psychiatric disorders. So in many instances where there is a case, there is another. In particular, if you look into the offspring of a bipolar parent, you know, they roughly like 10 to 15 times higher risk of developing bipolar disorder themselves than the general population. And they also are at a higher risk of developing some other mental health outcomes, things like depression, ADHD, anxiety. So that is a group that needs to be uh, looked at carefully. And, uh, and if there are early signs that things aren't doing well, going well, it's usually, you know, a kid that is very distractible or very moody, a little bit on the impulsive side, uh, those might be really warning signs that, uh, you know, the, the, the early signs and symptoms of bipolar disorder. Well, so we talked about the genetics, and we know it is generic because if you look at twin studies, having an identical twin puts you at a very high risk, like, uh, you know, 60-70% concordance. So essentially, if one has, you know, the chances that the other would. Then uh, for, for fraternal twins, which is like, I guess like regular uh, siblings as far as the genes go, then it's lower, you know, it's, uh, you know, I guess, ballpark around 20%. Uh, 
So this is data that really, oh, oh, and then when you, uh, so the, the heritability estimates here for bipolar, 0.8 to 0.9, for depression, 0.45. So it's a lot more heritable than schizophrenia or depression for sure. Well, so we've been interested in uh, looking uh, into some of the genetic underpinnings of these brain and neurocognitive abnormalities that bipolar patients have. Uh, we published a paper a few years back. Koji Matsu uh, is a former postdoc in my lab. He's now an associate professor at uh, Yamaguchi University in his uh, homeland, Japan, where he's been back there for a number of years. And uh, so, so there is a... Uh, a gene for what's called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That's an important neurotrophin in the brain, a protective factor in the brain. And there is a, a uh, variation in that particular gene. We call that like a polymorphism. This particular one, VAL66MET, has been described uh, in many studies as having uh, effects in, uh, in aspects of brain function and even brain anatomy. There's some uh, literature on this with schizophrenia, patients suffering from schizophrenia, and so we wanted to extend some of that to patients with bipolar disorder. What we found here, which is very interesting to us, so we genotyped the patients and we had the imaging uh, data, and uh, to top figure here measures of the left anterior cingulate, which, you know, when we just compare bipolars and healthy controls, anterior cingulate comes up as having a shrinkage Primarily, if you take patients that aren't on lithium. So that seems to be an area uh, you know, where uh, more regionally uh, pathology is, is happening. Uh, then the lower figure is uh, right anterior cingulate. So we had healthy subjects and patients with BD, and uh, we genotyped them. And uh, uh, so the med carriers, we call it, so, so the ones that have uh, uh, you know, the MET allele. So that's the risk, uh, 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 so that's the risk allele right here. So in, and what I want to show you here is that with the healthy controls, the size of the left anterior cingulate or the right anterior cingulate, you know, they had, had no effect on it. I mean, the, the, the numbers are very similar, not statistically different. However, within the patient group, the changes that we had found when we looked at the, all bipolars together seemed to be primarily driven by the, the MET carriers, the, one that had, the ones that had the risk allele for this particular uh, uh, you know, uh, genetic polymorphism, uh, both uh, uh, for the left anterior cingulate as well as the right anterior cingulate. So suggesting a gene by diagnosis effect and by the way, that had a good, good resemblance with what we found with the neurocognitive testing, primarily using a measure called the CVLT, the California Ver Variable Lear Learning uh, uh, Task, uh, which is a measure of uh, working memory, which is a domain consistently shown to be impaired, not only with bipolar patients, schizophrenics even more so, but uh, um, so, so th th that uh, polymorphism seems to be driving um, you know, a lot of this change in the anterior cingulate and, and you know, some of the uh, uh, findings uh, on the neurocog side, primarily as it pertains to CVLT measurements. Okay, so the, the real challenge here uh, has to do with uh, uh, our ability to identify early markers of vulnerability. So I'm telling you, I'm showing you here that there is some evidence that it seems to progress. And uh, so if folks have lived with this disease disorder for many years and have had multiple episodes, they have a lot of cognitive impairment, you know, we can help modulate their mood, we can help them live better lives, but might be a little too late to avert a lot of the brain pathology that takes place. You know, we, we know the brain has some plasticity and ability to heal, but generally not all the way back. So uh, early identification and intervention in our field, I believe, will prove to be uh, you know, as important as uh, in the field of cancer, where uh, you know, we can conquer most cancers these days as long as we catch it very early on. I believe this story with mental illness you know, will prove to be a lot like that. 
and I don't think I'm going to get a, an argument about this from Dr. Carter, who runs the early uh, psychosis, uh, the, the new onset, I, I guess, the, the, the first episode of psychosis clinic here, alongside with uh, Dr. Needham. Uh, so we, this is just a very preliminary study, but it's, it's intriguing data that we are excited about, and we want to, um, you know, hopefully get a, a large-scale uh, follow-up study uh, funded to, you know, to, to fully look into this, this particular issue. Well, so we had a, this is a paper that uh, came out uh, just last year, where we measured the size of the amygdala, and again, very consistently replicated size abnormalities. Several research groups have shown that, including ours. Uh, it's just a pilot study because we had 18 uh, uh, offspring of a bipolar parent that did not have BD, and then 20 offspring of a bipolar parent who had BD and 45 healthy controls. And you will see, I mean, the, yeah, the mean age is here, you know, somewhere, you know, 11 to 12, 13, that mean, mean uh, around 12 years old. Then uh, what I want to show you is that for, in our sample, I mean, the, the, the ones, the, the BDs, I guess the offspring of a bipolar parent who did not have BD, the amygdala size was larger, even uh, for some reason, than the healthy controls. So suggested, well, I mean, can this be like a, a perhaps a measure of uh, resilience? Uh, you know, if you have that highest risk by being the child of a bipolar parent, and at least when we uh, studied you, you, you hadn't developed that yet. So could this be an early marker of, uh, uh, I guess, in a way, the, of the resilience uh, for this disease? Uh, or, I mean, are we talking about some compensatory uh, changes that uh, take effect? One needs to do a longitudinal, larger scale longitudinal study to fully, uh, uh, you know, look into the development of these key brain structures over time, and, and to allow us to pinpoint early on the first signs of, uh, uh, of you know, problems, uh, so, so that hopefully we can tag that along with more effective uh, interventions. Well, so the last uh, thing that I want to mention here. I want to spend my, my final, I guess, five or, 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 or ten minutes uh, discussing this idea that's taken uh, some momentum in our field where perhaps some of these diseases have to do with, uh, uh, you know, some stress-induced inflammation that sets into the brain and that does not resolve and becomes, you know, more chronic and that might be the mediator of some of this brain pathology that, that I showed you here. It's happening in the brain, but could be ha it's probably happening systemically. And I've told you that you know, bipolar, folks with bipolar disorders, uh, bipolar disorder may, may have, uh, 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 do have a shortened lifespan. They suffer from certain medical problems at higher rates than folks who don't have it. So if there is some systemic inflammation, so it affects the brain, but it also affects all other organs of the body, like the heart, and uh, may help clog up uh, blood vessels. I mean, that, that could be some uh, more generalized, like a systemic, I mean, in, in the body, uh, in addition to uh, in the brain type of effects. Uh, this is a review paper from some colleagues at UC San Diego from like a few years back, essentially proposing that perhaps depression comes from, you know, so this repair response uh, is stress-induced and uh, some level of neuronal micro damage uh, sets in and becomes sort of like a chronic uh, uh, neuroinflammatory uh, condition. And so I, I, you know, that's an exciting idea and something that needs to be fully investigated. And if that happens to be an important mechanism, uh, uh, there may be very effective ways to intervene if we find the right time windows. Uh, I want to show you this picture from, uh, so, so in uh, what's called the sickness be behavior is uh, very much driven by more inflammation in the brain. And uh, so it's a patient with like, uh, well, in many types of uh, uh, rheumatological conditions I mean, where there's a lot of inflammation, these folks have behavioral changes that really mimic uh, what we see in depression. And then um, if you give some uh, uh, pro-inflammatory agents to rodents, uh, like for example, if you inject what's called uh, uh, a TNF, uh, tumor necrotic factor into rodents, they, they will 
you know, develop behavior changes that really resemble what you see uh, in depression. So that's known. Essentially, provides a link here between more inflammation and the behavioral changes uh, you know that we see when somebody's depressed. Well, and then this is uh, the, the, the sort of like an illustration of what we discussed from that uh, nice uh, review paper that I showed you from, from the colleagues at UCSD. Essentially where some, you know, perhaps in stress induced, could, could be just also uh, immunology, you know, aspects of immunology where the body begins to, uh, uh, well, like in autoimmune diseases, but perhaps at a milder uh, level, and the body begins to produce un antibodies that are actually damaging uh, neurons. Uh, and there is uh, microglial activation, I mean, those are the, 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 the cells in the brain that will help with the repair response. And, uh, and that could actually chronify and uh, lead to some damage that uh, uh, sustains after the more episodes you have. Well, so in our field, people are beginning to talk about this idea of neural progression, like uh, uh, essentially that this disease uh, progresses over time and some uh, rewiring of the brain, uh, so neural inflammation could be involved, uh, perhaps uh, you know, more uh, like oxidative stress. Uh, people have talked about perhaps like a, some level of mitochondrial dysfunction. I mean, you know, that, that hypothesis is out there. Ha hasn't been, you know, fully proven or disproven. Uh, and, 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 and then, uh, you know, like Hosseini Manji talks about, uh, uh, you know, abnormalities, abnormalities in, in neuronal resilience that perhaps um, levels of certain neurotrophins are um, lower. And, and again, you know, you can think of like inflammation uh, impairing uh, the f neuronal functioning and, and resulting on, on lower levels of uh, key neurotrophins uh, and, and as this uh, uh, pathology uh, progresses. And uh, so, so we do believe that understanding this progression will hold the key for uh, better treatments for this disease. Uh, Isabel Bauer is a postdoc in my lab, and we published a review paper, uh, I guess, just last year. Essentially, and again, this is still uh, um, in speculation, but, but making a compelling case that perhaps, you know, if these folks have cognitive impairment, they have detectable brain changes, even anatomical changes, that perhaps inflammation mediates that. The caveat here is that the bulk of the literature is from measuring inflammation peripherally. And again, you know, there are animal models that can be used to link inflammation to brain damage uh, uh, as well. But as far as having methodologies that will uh, let us uh, study the inflammatory mechanism in the in vivo brain, there are some things in the horizon. You know, there aren't great, but you know, coming up, I, I know that Kim has some interesting ideas for you know, some exciting things that can be done. Uh, in our center, we're beginning to work uh, uh, with a pet center that is actually in partnership with MD Anderson. It's literally uh, next door to our, to the psychiatry building. And uh, a particular tracer uh, that, that seems to be a good measure of microglial activation that allows us to probe that uh, in, with the, you know, patients uh, in, in vivo and, and, and then repeat the measurements to see how that progresses. So we're very excited about that. Uh, well, you know, we talked a little bit about whether this progress or not. So the, the, we've done some reanalysis, recent reanalysis of some of our, uh, you know, the, 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 this, if you keep doing this long enough, the data sets, they grow, and that's a good thing because it gives us more power to, uh, you know, try to answer some of the, the, the important questions. And uh, so here what we did, we, we focused on the size of the hippocampus as measured in our uh, uh, bipolar, patients with bipolar disorder and healthy controls. And we separated them. We said, okay, so early course, uh, and we, uh, I guess, we, early course in this particular study, we said, uh, no, up to three episodes of the illness. And then uh, late course, 10 or more. And then we had the ones in between. So we pretty much divided that by number of episodes they had. And for the hippocampal measure, we will see here that while the you know, early course and intermediate uh, in our sample here, not quite different from the healthy controls. 
if we focus on the late, we call those late stage, that's where the hippocampus was more clearly shrunk. And uh, we saw that also for some of the CVLT uh, data where, if you see here, the, uh, you know, the late stage ones, I mean, we're a lot more impaired in, uh, in the CVLT measures, but I mean, there's a nice spread here where you see that even early, I mean, this is more, seems like a more sensitive measure where even early in the course, it already, already distinguishes from healthy controls. And, but, but late stage seems to have more pronounced uh, changes. So it fits this notion that it is progressing. Uh, uh, Luca Lavanino, and also an, 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 a postdoc in our lab. And uh, so Luca uh, focused on uh, uh, corpus callosum side as related to the stage of the illness. Uh, for some reason, in the males, the data was not so as clear cut, but the women did have, I mean, the late stage women had a, uh, uh, like smaller measures of the uh, corpus callosum compared to, uh, you know, healthy controls uh, or uh, you know, the bipolars here in, in early uh, stage of the illness. So, so there's data from our lab and others showing that it seems to progress. A uh, larger scale longitudinal study uh, has not done yet. I mean, and unlike the field of schizophrenia, I mean, where there have been larger efforts, multi-site studies following these folks. So that needs to be done uh, for bipolar disorder. Well, so uh, what is out there in the horizon? And, and what I'm going to tell you here, I mean, those things are true, totally, I mean, experimental. None of this is approved. But I pick the three things that excite me the most. And I'll show uh, you know, that, those to you here. One is, well, if there seems to be some neuroinflammation mediating uh, some of these brain changes, could it be that anti-inflammatory agents might help? So, so we did this trial. Charlie Bowden is my, my uh, former boss from, uh, well, he was the department chair when I was the division chief for mood and anxiety. He's a great guy who recruited me to UT in San Antonio. Uh, we did a proof of concept study. It was a small double blind study funded by the Stanley Medical Research Institute, which, uh, I mean, they've been very generous uh, in funding a lot of the early clinical trials in bipolar and schizophrenia. Uh, so, what we found here uh, a signal, uh, I mean, this was, by the way, a six week trial. Patients who had been on conventional treatments but not responding, they had, you know, some level of depression usually in the moderate range, despite being on different treatments. And uh, so we randomized them blindly to uh, either celecoxib, which is an anti-inflammatory medication, a, a COX-2, a cyclooxygenase type 2 inhibitor, or placebo, the sugar pill. And uh, so, so some interesting signal here. It seems like for week one, the ones who got the anti-inflammatory agent seem to improve faster at a trend level, not statistically significant. But then, at the end of the trial, that, seemed to, that signal seemed to disappear. And, and then, I mean, it, it's not to throw the baby with the, ba the, 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 the bathwater, where if, if you talk to colleagues who are, you know, who know a lot about, uh, uh, you know, inflammation and anti-inflammatory drugs, they say, well, so perhaps there are agents that cross the blood-brain barrier more uh, uh, pronouncedly than celecoxib. Uh, and uh, and celecoxib is you know it's it's a more I mean it's it's a, a selective uh, 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 inhibitor of this particular enzyme, so perhaps uh, by uh, modulating other aspects, I mean you'd find uh, uh, in effect. Well, and here's uh, some data that gives us uh, things to think about. It's a trial done at Emory University by uh, Dr. Raison, Chuck Raison. Uh, so they gave, uh, well, they had patients with uh, uh, depression that had been resistant to treatment. And those are not bipolar patients, by the way. Th these were folks who had other types of medical illnesses that required them to, to receive very potent anti-inflammatory uh, uh, drugs. So they gave uh, uh, a, a, an agent called infliximab, which is an antagonist of TNF. Uh, so, so the interesting point here, this was also a, a, a controlled study, proof of concept study. For the whole group, the ones who got infliximab versus placebo did not differ. But when they split the patients by the level of inflammation they had at baseline, which they did here, 
you know, the ones with more inflammation were actually responders. There was a, a statistically significant improvement here in the depression compared to the ones with lesser levels of inflammation where, you know, infliximab, if anything, I mean, I, I don't think this was statistically significant, but might have made them a little worse. So essentially suggesting that, I mean, well, perhaps going on a more guided fashion where, okay, so if you want to modulate inflammation, let's be sure that those are, that's sort of like the subtype or the group of, of depressed patients or bipolar patients that have higher levels of inflammation. So, so this type of like more guided uh, 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 therapy is needed. In many instances, we dilute these responses in clinical trials. You know, by giving it to everybody and then measuring the average response, which seems to be the case for this, you know, this small study needs to be looked at further. But like I was uh, telling you before, it gives us a lot of food for thought. Well, then, uh, this is actually probably, I mean, I, I, in my opinion, the biggest story uh, in our field of psychiatry, or at least I, I'm, I'm going to be more, more modest here, in, in, in mood disorders, the biggest story for the last decade is really ketamine. And uh, so this is uh, uh, a, a, an anesthetic drug uh, that some people abuse uh, on the street. Uh, but at the doses used here, those are much lower than anesthetic doses. Some people may get very transient, brief psychotic symptoms, if any, most don't. So it sedates them a little bit. Some may have like a brief, you know, uh, uh, feel a little unreal, I mean, more so than floridly psychotic. Uh, and we monitor them for a couple of hours and uh, for some reason the depression magically alleviates in many of these folks, many, many. I mean, they, 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 this has been shown by a few different groups in the country. Uh, and, but it doesn't last long. So give it a week or 10 days, depression comes back. So very reliable. People have shown that a, 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 an acute injection of ketamine at doses there are about like, you know, three to five times lower than the doses that would you know, anesthetize them, put them to sleep, folks to sleep, they have these really powerful effects. And, uh, um, you know, people think, well, perhaps, I mean, ketamine has properties as like an NMDA receptor antagonist. So that's what's credited as uh, uh, the reason for these uh, effects. Now it remains to be uh, figured out how often you need to do the booster injections. And with the caveat here that uh, ketamine is, really cheap. I mean, we are beginning, we're planning for a study with folks, uh, we, we look into some aspects of uh, suicidality, folks coming into our uh, acute hospital. Well, I mean, you buy a dose for $6. I mean, it's dirt cheap. So there's never going to be a drug company interested in this unless one find all their delivery methods. Like, for example, I mean, the one trial that may result on FDA approval is actually with uh, uh, inhaled ketamine, which I'm sure is going to cost a lot more. But, but so, so there's this genetic drug that is dirt cheap, some solid studies showing very intriguing, interesting results. And we know that no company is ever going to undertake a large scale. So this is never going to be approved by the FDA in this particular formulation. You know. So uh, it is intriguing stuff, and uh, I believe it is at a, a stage where we, we, you know, we really need to uh, gain more experience with it. And uh, so, so in our uh, center, I mean, we, we debated this quite a bit. We felt, look, it's never going to be FDA approved. There's some robust data there. Uh, we want to be able to offer this to patients who have tried other things and have not responded. But let's do that under the scrutiny of a, an IRB. And uh, so we've set up this very flexible, it's like an unfunded, very flexible research protocol. But that needs IRB approval, it needs a DSMB, which is sort of like the body that uh, we have to put together to monitor the, you know, to, till we learn more about it. And, and I think the questions that remain is really, there's no doubt it helps acutely. But uh, how often do we need these booster injections? And then figuring out, I mean, you know, the patients that might benefit from that. There's some, some concern. Well, people say, look, uh, like ECT, if, if you give several 
uh, uh, repeated treatments, is that safe? Can that cause some further damage to the brain? Uh, you know, it's been looked at in, in uh, not, not extensively, but apparently not. You know, at least two. I mean, nobody. There's nobody who's been on ketamine injections for like a, like a year or two. But but in studies where they've had repeated injections over some months, so there is still need, need, the, the need to monitor carefully and also a disclaimer to people got to understand that this is certainly not approved, still experimental but that we view that there is enough evidence out there. I mean, this could help folks. And uh, we know that uh, if we wait for an FDA approval, I mean, that's not likely to come any, any time soon. I, I'm a very conservative person by nature, and I, I'm not, never the, the first one to jump on prescribing the latest thing. But I, I really, you know, I think this is a, a credible story, and folks could benefit from that. Well, then the last thing, I mean, the. Um, so, so, you know, psychiatry and neurosurgery together, uh, you know, the, the last time we did that more systematically, no good things have come. I mean, you know, this was like, you know, uh, uh, back in the day, or I guess, Egas, Moniz, and, uh, you know, we ended up with a lobotomy, and uh, that was very widely uh, applied and abused and so, so, you know, so if, if people see a neurosurgeon and a psychiatrist talking, I mean, they're going to say, oh, what are they up to? <laughs> so, for for <laughs> the, 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 the historical reasons. And uh, so, but this is not a uh, sledgehammer. I mean, the, the DBS is a deep brain stimulation. You essentially implant an electrode in the patient's brain. And there's a wire that comes here in the neck and goes under the, 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 the chest wall here and the muscles in the chest. And uh, you can put that electrode in different parts of the brain. And uh, what I'm showing here is work by Paul Holzheimer and Helen Mayberg from Emory University. They've been one of the pioneers in this area as it relates to mood disorders. So they tested this particular target. It's just, just an, an illustration of where that electrode goes in, into the brain. But once you lodge it there, and again, this requires surgery, uh, you can play with the uh, stimulation parameters. And actually, once you place it, you, you know, it's very methodical to try to find the part of the brain in that general vicinity that might give the best benefit. And so, so it, it's targeted, but it is invasive. So this is for somebody who has failed everything else, including ECT. Uh, this particular target that Dr. Mayberg uh, and Dr. Holzheimer have uh, explored, they, they called the subgenual anterior cingulate. There is a lot of evidence from the depression literature showing that this is a, a very important uh, uh, region in, in the mechanisms involved. But the trials have not been successful. There was one. Uh, multi-site trial done by a company that was actually stopped as a negative study. So uh, we now, um, you know, we've been impressed that, uh, uh, with a, a new target that's been uh, explored by some colleagues in Germany. And uh, the, the, the lead psychiatrist there is a guy named Tom Schlepfer. And uh, they go for uh, what's called the medial forebrain bundle, which, I mean, it's a very interesting area, lots of like, uh, uh, you know, it, it's very close to many of these, uh, 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 well, where the cir circuits, frontal limbic circuits will uh, uh, path, pa uh, pass. And uh, well, anyway, Dr. Schlepper uh, did a, an experimental study with DBS, placing the electrode in the middle four brain bundle, published a study showing some very impressive results that seem almost, you know, too good to be true and needs to be uh, uh, replicated and expanded. And that's what we've set up to do at our center. Uh, so we have a new DBS trial. And uh, my partner there is a young neurosurgeon named Al Fenoy. He's, he's a great guy. And uh, you know, is this going to pan out as an alternative? We don't know. But what I've been very impressed, have you, can, been, uh, have you seen a DBS surgery for depression? Uh, uh, have you been in the OR? At, I, that was an experience. I mean, I was. Not everybody has what I'm going to describe here. But uh, so out of our four patients so far, two. Well, so, so what Dr. Fenoy tells me, and by the way, the, the DBS device is approved by the FDA for Parkinson's disease 
that does not respond to medication. So he does, you know, he does a few of those every week. The novelty here is really the depression part. When he's doing the surgery for patients with Parkinson's, it's a different part of the brain, and they go by, the patient is kept awake for a good portion of the procedure because he wants to fine tune the positioning in the general vicinity of you know, this part of the brain he's targeting from the anatomy. And, and so, so he wants to see what is the sweet spot where the tremors are minimized. You know? In the depression surgery, uh, we actually, I'm, I'm, I'm the psychiatrist, I'm, I'm in the OR, or, or if I'm not there, there's a colleague who is there. And then we ask folks questions about you know, their mood and their energy, and, uh, uh, and it is amazing to see. I mean, once, it, for these two patients, once, and again, he, he goes like little, like half of a millimeter more this way, more that, that way, and, uh, uh, but so, so uh, for, for two out of the four, once we found a sweet spot, Folks who were very anxious, very depressed, very negative, you know, they perk up and they are more confident, they are calmer. One of the patients told me that she felt like she wanted to jog. And I said, well, when was the last time you jogged? That was like three years ago. So, uh, and that I, she wanted to go and like, uh, uh, you know, fix up her stuff and clean up her house. and. Uh, so, I mean, there is, I mean, I'm not implying that that's something sustainable, you know, that's the key. So, so I mean, but, but the acute effect is amazing. I mean, to think that there is a part of our brain where we can implant an electrode in like two minutes of stimulation, you know, you turn it on for a couple of minutes and, and, and the negativity disappears and you are more energetic, more positive. It's not mania or hypomania, you know, it's just, a change in outlook. You you speak more freely. So I, I do. I mean I, I that converted me. I mean I think there is uh, something there that really needs to be explored farther, and it will involve you know finding the right region, the right stimulation parameters. And uh, neurosurgeons will tell you that this is. I mean for them it's safe. For us psychiatrists, I mean they, they, like a one percent chance of like bleeding in the brain. That doesn't seem safe to me. But I mean but but again. We gotta keep in mind that those are folks who failed. I mean, our patients, they, it's literally, I mean, they, they require it's at least three medications plus at least one full trial of ECT. Most have had all medications known to man, you know, plus more than, you know, just the one course of like, you know, I guess six to 10 ECT sessions. And, 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 and they're very limited and they can't function. I mean, so, so at that level, you know, if there is, uh, something more aggressive that carries a good chance of treatment response, you know, that I, I might consider that, uh, you know, if, if I'm in that type of uh, situation. So, so it's a study just starting out. We've done, we've studied, uh, we've, uh, we've done four implantations and uh, Tom Schlapp first data and also Dr. Mayberg's data for the, the other target that she, the different target that she's uh, focusing on. But, the, the, it seems like a lot of the response might be cumulative where after six months you will see a good percentage that may have responded and give it a year, that percentage increases and if you give it two years, that percentage might go even farther. So this is something that I'm excited about that I think could have some really uh, good applications. Well, for the ones that already have a lot of pathology, but the, the most exciting part really is uh, I, I think stepping up our science and our game with uh, early detection, early recognition, you know, catching these kids at risk before they develop full-blown bipolar disorder. I really believe that that's how we're gonna transform the, the course of this illness and hopefully deliver much better outcomes to our patients and their families, you know, than we are able to deliver these days, unfortunately. Uh, well, and this is uh, what I had. Uh, the, the final thing is just to uh, uh, acknowledge the uh, folks who have supported our research, NIH, the Stanley Foundation. Dunn Foundation is a local, it's a Houston area foundation. They've been very nice, generous. They actually funded the DBS study that I was t showing you guys in, in uh, the Ruther Ford family in uh, Houston. I mean, they've been also, uh, you know, very generous towards mental health causes there. Thank you so much.
The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.